Hello. We were here for about an hour yesterday with our Linux laptops trying to get them to work with this projector, but it's all good. Um, so I'm Rod Vag. I'm from Australia, um, and my ancestors were Norwegian Vikings, so that's why I'm here. Um, is there anyone else here from that part of the world, Australia or New Zealand? A couple, awesome. And Dominic, too. So I, I'm leading a block called, that we're calling Nodebase. Um, and there's, there's two more guys following. There's Julian Gruber. Oh, sorry, Dominic Tarr is going to follow me directly, and then Julian Gruber is going to follow me. We're going to try and build on the content for you to give you a picture of what's going on in this area of Node. Um, so my talk is just to introduce the ideas here, and then uh, hopefully we'll get some more meaty stuff out of the next couple of talks. So my talk's titled A Real Database Rethink. And I know there's, there's a lot of, every so often we have something come out saying, you know, we've got the database reimagined or, you know, rethink DB, whatever, that somehow there's a big revolution happening. You know, revolutions don't happen that often in technology. They, they have happened in the database world a few times, but mostly it, we're adding features or interaction methods. I think what's going on in the Node community, though, may count at some stages as a kind of a revolution, and hopefully you'll see why I think that by the end of this. So it's been called Node-based now. I think that's the name we're sort of settling on because it's, it's sort of a bit more um, generic than it once was. It's Level is the other name, and you'll see why uh, in a minute, why it's called Level, but these two terms are interchangeable in, this, in what we're doing. So I'm going to start with the database history. This is not a database. This is, this is a lady loading some tapes onto a, a big batch computer. But this is, this is the genesis of the database, because you, you can, it, I mean, not, not many of us would have been around at this stage, maybe a few of us. But you can imagine the frustration of doing batch jobs and interacting with your data in a serial way. So having to submit something, and then your data is very static. So databases were born out of this frustration when we started to have spinning disks. So we moved from tapes and batch to spinning disks so we could have shared access to our data and we could have interactivity with our data. So this is where databases started because we wanted to get to our data a lot more accessible. The first databases uh, were navigational databases. And you'll recognize this idea because it's still around, where each point in the database points to another component of the database. So it's all about links, and you get to data by following the links through the database. You have to navigate to your content. Um, XPath is a good example of a kind of a navigational concept today where you, you have to follow particular links to get to what you want. But this is not really enough because it's about the links, not the content. So in the early 1970s, um, the relational model was started to be born, and this came out of relational algebra. Um, where we could start to be more mathematical about our data. And content became the king of the, um, of the database here, where we wanted to get to the content, we wanted to search by the content, and we wanted the content to be able to relate to each other. And then SQL came along, and this is probably a, a, one of the revolutions. SQL formalized relation, the relational model, gave us a, a language to interact with our data and manipulate it and, and, and deal with the content. In the early... 1980s, we had databases on our desktop. So DBase came along, and there's a few others, and the modern incarnation is like Microsoft Access and uh, FileMaker, all these sort of um, database desktop programs where you can then have this interactive data tool on your own desktop that you don't even have to share with anyone else. So that was a, you know interesting thing happening there. In the late 1980s, we had this object-oriented obsession, and we wanted to make everything object-oriented. Um, it's not to dismiss object-oriented. I, I come from an object-oriented background. But the problem that was being addressed here was that the data models that we have didn't connect well with the applications that we were writing. So we thought, let's adapt our databases to speak more like our applications. And on the other end of this trend, we have ORMs, which are the reverse, which is trying to make the, our applications look more like the database so that we can have a similar language between the two. And then in the 2000s, we have speed and scale. You know, we wanted to scale things up. We wanted to be fast. And so we came, we came up with NoSQL. And this is all also about being agile. Databases um, are inherently fairly fixed. Um, and NoSQL, database, NoSQL databases are about being able to be agile with how we build our data, how we structure it. And then lastly, we've got NewSQL. And 
I've titled this, Never Let a Beautiful Abstraction Go to Waste. We just can't get let go of it because it's so awesome. So this is a, an attempt to bridge the SQL world with, world with the NoSQL world. So we have the benefits of NoSQL with the benefits of SQL. But anyway, moving on, just on this topic of um, SQL and abstractions. Um, th what, this is what I think is the tyranny of a beautiful abstraction, and I think programmers are fairly guilty of this amongst most communities. We're, we're one of the more guilty communities. Um, when we find an abstraction that fits many problems very well, we'll make it fit lots of problems that aren't, you know, are related, but it doesn't necessarily fit well. So um, SQL is one of these things that it, it's, it's beautiful. Like, it is an amazing abstraction. The, the relational model is fantastic for data. So we munge it into all these different places where maybe we shouldn't be, but it is such a, a nice abstraction. And so this is um, an example of Maslow's hammer, which is the truism that, you know, to a man with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Um, we do this. We're on the search for the, for the perfect abstraction to solve all our problems, to describe the world for us, and then we can use that abstraction across all of the different things that we do. So this is a common theme in the database world. It's not necessarily a bad thing because abstractions are really good and helpful, but we can be blinded by um, you know, the, abstract, the, the beauty of the abstraction. So that comes down to what, what is a database? And this is actually really hard to, to define, and you won't find very clear de definitions of it um, when you go searching for it, um, because we all think it's something different. And the evolution of the database has, sort of in, in, has exposed us to new ideas. So the, the definition that I have come up with, I think, covers enough that we could all vaguely agree on it. It's a tool for interacting with structured data externalized from the core of our application. So a, a, a data structure in memory is structured data, but it's in the core of our application. You wouldn't call a data structure a database necessarily. It's just a bit of memory that you're using. So it's about externalizing it from the, the core of our application logic. Um, generally, we want these things persistence, performance, and we want to simplify access to complex data. Um, these concepts are kind of vague, like persist what is persistence? Um, for example, uh, is Redis a database um, if it just keeps stuff in memory? Um, does it become a database once you start using snapshots? So you've got persistence. Um, what about memcache? Is that a database? If that doesn't stay just snapshots, it's just a purely in memory thing. So if that's not a database, what if you took Postgres, which is clearly a database, but you mounted a, a, a store on, a, a, on tempfs? So you had a temporary um, storage. Does it suddenly not become a database? So the, the idea of persistence is a little bit vague, but you get the idea that you want it to persist um, through your application's lifetime in some way. Um, and often, databases also involve shared access to our data. We want to be able to connect to it from different places. We want different people to access it. And scalability is, is more and more important these days. So that these are the things that we ask for from our database systems. OK. Um, so let's talk about Node, because this is a Node conference. <laughs> uh, so the Node approach. This is the Node approach, I think, in a, in a few dot points. Small core and a vibrant user land. The core of Node is really small. Amongst most platforms, it's, it's one of the smaller ones where it, you've got the really basic functionality in the core, and the rest of the functionality is in this user land that competes for developer attention, um, and it's re extremely vibrant. Um, extreme modularity, and thanks, to, I think this is, this is one of the, the defining aspects of Node, is the, um, the ex <laughs> extreme modularity that I've got no idea what was going on here. OK, I'll let someone else fix that. So extreme modularity, where NPM lets us do modules really easily. Uh, we can publish tiny modules, and it's so easy, and we can pull them in, and we can have different versions of them in our application. Um, so that's how we develop. And you've all seen the, the graphs of the package growth in, um, the, the, in NPM compared to other platforms. And it's not because node programmers are writing more, more code, it's because they're writing more packages, and it's often these packages are extremely small. Um, and then there's this drive to re-implement everything in JavaScript. This is a, um, a, a, a defining aspect of JavaScript programmers. We want everything in JavaScript. And sometimes there's good reasons for that, because JavaScript truly is um, a, a common language across platforms. 
we can use JavaScript in browsers, we can use it on the server, we can use it on devices. So having things in JavaScript is nice. So you know, let's do JS Git and all the rest of it. What do I need to do if it stops again? I'll just stay here. Oh, he's going to stay here. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> For the whole day. OK. Um, so how do we apply that to, to databases? <laughs> so we have a small core, and that small core at the moment is level up. It's a simple library. Um, you can get it in NPM, and it's, it's really simple. <laughs> um, everything is a module. So all of the functionality is a module, and you have a competing module ecosystem as well. So you've got modules that do the same thing, and they compete for attention on quality and all the rest of it. And then we're also, this rewrite everything in JavaScript, we're pulling in database um, practice and theory into JavaScript land, into Node. So we're going out there. We've got people like Dominic who are doing these raids on Academe and going out there getting ideas from um, the database researchers and pulling them into Node, implementing them in, um, in, in Node so that we can use them. Um, and then what we end up with is, is targeted solutions to specific problems. So we can take this package of libraries and build targeted solutions for what we're doing. So that's sort of what we're doing in, um, in Node. OK, so this is the, 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 the Node database ecosystem. And you don't need to understand all of it. It's just this idea that we've got this core in the middle, level up, which is smaller than, I mean, it's actually quite small. It's not relative to the size of that line. Um, above level up, we have these extensibility libraries. And they are mainly for extending the features of level up. So we have these packages like sublevel, level hooks, level mutex, even possibly multi-level might be included in that where these are little packages that you can use to extend the functionality. You don't have to use them, but they are helpful for that. You've got these extensions that it's an it's a ecosystem of, of many, many extensions. I've only put a few up there that actually add features to level up or extend it in some way to turn it into something that's more useful for your use case. And then above that, we have these, I've called them packages. And these are packages that use all these things, but don't necessarily extend it in a way that um, makes it recognizable. So you have, in that section there, you've got fully featured databases like TacoDB, which Nearform is putting some effort into, um, which is a very node modular database. Uh, CouchUp, which Michael is his current obsession, which is re-implementing CouchDB in Node, um, going really well. And LevelGraph, which Matteo, who's speaking soon, well, today, um, it, that's a graph database in Node. And each of these things also have their own um, particularly TacoDB and LevelGraph now is growing a, an ecosystem of modules on top of them as well. So there's these expanding ecosystems, sub-ecosystems that are happening. Then we've got tools at the top there, which are tools for interacting with databases. So they're built on these things for interacting with them. And one of the main ones is Lev um, by Paolo, who's here as well. And this is a tool where you can inspect the contents of your database on the command line. The important bit I want to talk about, though, is this, this, the yellow bits below, which um, are our storage units. So level up doesn't implement a whole database in itself. It's an abstraction layer. And below level up, we have these different storage plug, plug, pluggable storage layers that we can use. The main one that, that we use, encouraged by default, is called level down. And level down is a wrapper around level DB, Google's fast key value store. So when you put these two together, you suddenly have a usable key value store. But you don't have to use it. You can swap it out for one of the two main forks of LevelDB. One's by Basho, which is used in React. Um, you can put that in. You can just insert it into Node, and you've got their version. And the other one is um, the HyperLevelDB, which is by the guys that wrote Hyperdex. Um, so you can plug that in as well if you want. Um, then we've got some other interesting th projects, like MemDown, which is a pure in-memory database, um, which is you know, a bit of a toy, but some people are finding it useful. Level.js is one of the most interesting bits here. It's a, a wrapper around index DB in the browser. So, and this is by Max Ogden. You can go and have a look at this on GitHub. It's fascinating. But you can then bundle level up, level JS, and any of these plugins, and they all run in the browser um, without needing you know, to compile or anything or you know, all the node dependencies that we normally have. It's pure browser. Level down gap is similar. It's for local storage and, and phone gap. Um, LMDB is really new, it's just released recently. It's a wrapper around the MDB data store, which is based on Berkeley DB. It's got some really interesting performance characteristics. It can be faster than level DB in some instances. Um, I'll, I'm going, I'll write a post about that soon for anyone that's interested, because it's an interesting use case. 
and MySQL down as a crazy experiment, which is backing all this stuff by a MySQL database. So you interact with level up all, all the plugins in Node as if it's a key value store, but you're actually talking to MySQL. Um, whether or not that's useful is questionable. <laughs> um, so quickly, I'll just talk about LevelDB because LevelDB is part of the genesis of all this. LevelDB is an open source embedded key value store written by Google, primarily designed for Chromium. So it's, it's in every Chrome browser on Android, on desktops, LevelDB is there backing index DB. And it's also used to store a whole lot of other stuff, configuration data. Uh, it's extremely fast. It's sorted by keys. It's one of the important things here. Um, as keys go in, they get put in sorted order. Um, values are compressed by Snappy, which is a very fast compression algorithm. Doesn't do heaps of compression, but it's very fast. Uh, its basic operations are put, uh, sorry, get, put, and delete. Uh, it has an atomic batch, so you do lots of writes in a single batch that either all succeed or all fail. And it has bidirectional iterators, so you can pick any point in the database and you can go forward and backwards in this sorted range. So LevelDB has inspired LevelUp, and it was the genesis of LevelUp. Um, so level up in there, I'm now saying it's backed by a key value store because it used to be for level DB, but now it's for anything that can implement our primitives. So it's backed by a key value store for, um, for arbitrary data. It can be binary, um, UTF-8, whatever you like, and it's sorted by key. That's the important feature that we need from a storage system. Key opera core operations, just like level DB, are put, get, and delete. We have atomic batch writes. Sometimes the storage layer can't implement that, um, but we tried our best to, to, to implement that. Read streams are the version of iterators that are exposed in Node land. They're extremely Node friendly. They're, it's just like using a stream, an object stream, and anything else in Node. And this is the way you interact with your sorted data, and it, this is where the power of it comes from. We also have a write stream. It's there for the symmetry with read stream, but we were just talking that we, that actually might be removed from the call because it's a non-essential feature, and there's possibly competing implementations that um, we might, you might want to swap in and out. And I've put the pictures here of all of the people that are, these are the committers and owners of LevelUp. These guys all have a share in LevelUp and an interest in it. Um, LevelUp is an open project, so what happens is if you submit a patch to it, a, a pull request that is non-trivial and that gets us accepted, you get to share in the ownership of this thing. So these people have all done this, and they're all extremely involved, and so issues get thoroughly discussed, pull requests get thoroughly analysed, and the quality of this code just increases because you've got the extreme, these extremely smart people all making sure that this thing um, works really well. It also puts pressure on it to stay small because it's difficult to get new features in. You can't just come along and say, I want message pack encoding in there because these guys are going to say, no, go make a plugin for it. So it's, it, it, this is really good incentive to keep the core small. Um, so if I've got time, I just want to quickly talk about this read stream because it's one of the key um, primitives of level, level up. Is that right? Here? <laughs> 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 uh, <laughs> so read stream, it's, a, um, it's an essential primitive for building complex features because if we just had get and put, um, then it's difficult to build things that are useful. Um, so it's a, it's a query mechanism. We can access our sorted data with it. And it has arbitrary start and end value. So you can start at the beginning and end at the end of the data store. You can stream the whole lot of it. Or you can start at any point in the database and end at any point. And the point that you start doesn't even have to exist. So you can target it at some key that you think might exist or a partial prefix of a key, and it'll jump to the next one. So it's, it's a really useful mechanism for finding data and for guessing ranges. So an example I've got here is if you had a database of, um, of all of the towns in Ireland, and you want to look up the ones that start with water, uh, I create a read stream, and I give it the start water. Now, there's no town called water, but it'll jump to the first town that starts with water in sorted order. The end, I've given, I've said water, and I've put the last ASCII character there. So that includes every um, word that has water at the beginning all the way up to if it had water plus the last ASCII character, which is a bit ridiculous. But that would include everything. <laughs> and what you would get out of this is just three values. So it would get in there, efficiently grab three values, and spit them out. And this is extremely fast and extremely powerful query mechanism. But what it means is you have to start 
thinking about key structure because the sorting um, means that you have to get things right so that you can query them. So I've put a couple of values in here, um, a couple of examples, and what we're looking at here is hierarchical descriptors. So let's say we've got a database with a bunch of different things in it. At the top here, I've got countries. So the keys start with the word countries, and I've got some separator, and then country names, and I might have every country in the world. The next one are towns. I might have every town in the world, but I start with the word towns, so that it's categorized, then the country that the town is in, and then the town name. So what you can do there, you can say, I, I want to see all the towns in Ireland. So you say, OK, start with towns, separator, island, and the end, towns, separator, island, with the, that last ASCII key, and you would get all the towns in Ireland. Same with streets here, streets, um, country, town, and the street name. But obviously, this, is, this doesn't suit every case, because you can't get all of the streets in the world, for example, without, no, all of the, you can't get all of the, uh, all the, the towns in, in the world, yeah. So um, if, if you have particular needs for your queries, you're going to have to think about key design differently. But the cool thing is that this kind of thinking is built into modules, and we're seeing more and more modules sort of available that take away this hard work for you. And one of them is sublevel, which gives you sub-databases that have hierarchical key structures. And even things down to um, the separator design there. I've used the tilde character, but uh, it's not necessarily the best choice, um, because if I printed it like the null character, for example, you wouldn't be able to see it. But there's, there's all these things you've got to think about with key structures, but they're starting to be taken care of with these modules in the, in the, the module ecosystem. So what we have is building blocks. We have a one-dimensional storage array. It's just key values in a big, long line, sorted. And we want to take that and we want to turn it into multi a multi-dimensional tool for customized solutions. So we want to do all of those things that our databases do for us, but we want to target the individual problems that we have in our applications. And we want to build these custom solutions just for those things. Or perhaps we want to actually build a database that has all of the features that we want to use across our application. Not necessarily the best approach, but maybe that works for you. Um, so the le level ecosystem is becoming a menu of beautiful but small abstractions. So these little modules that you can piece together to build these custom solutions to the, the problems in our application. So um, that's the end of my talk. But uh, Dominic is going to talk about, he's going to show some cool modular stuff, and then Julian's going to do some live coding around this area. But we have a workshop that's going to be happening at some point where if you have questions on any of this stuff, you can come and ask. But we also have some very structured content um, for you to, to work through if you're keen. So I just want to encourage you to have a look into this. Um, try and you know, take away, step back from the preconceived ideas about what a database is and should be, and start to think about what the real needs of your applications are and how can you insert you know, custom solutions. Because we're used to running custom solutions, we're used to writing our own web servers. HTTP.create server. You tell that to somebody 20 years ago, and how crazy would that be? Um, we're doing that. That's, we're not used to doing that. So why not do the same thing with databases? So that's me. And I might hand over now to Michael. Thank you. Woo.